Cubs. Yeah, and then yeah. and then the miracle happens and brings right. Yes. Then Willem gets to see the sailboat. Yeah, and to be clear, right, if we were to accept Martin's narrative, the rest of Martin's narrative where he loses his faith is fucking insane. Right. <laughs> if I saw an angel right now in the middle of this podcast, I'd stop podcasting. Sure I would. would make the almost done five minutes hand gesture and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because I'm not flexible enough to actually go fuck myself. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you doing this fine afternoon, sir? Moment, movie, moment! Finally, it's been way too long. <laughs> oh, I've missed it. I thought you guys had made it out. I thought you were going to be, you were clear of it, but they keep pulling you back <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah, right, right. That's Just right. when you think... You're out. And that voice you just heard, of course, that is the co-host of Thank God I'm Atheist and the new podcast, Data Over Dogma, Dan Beecher. Dan, welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's been a minute. I'm very happy to be back. Yeah, yeah. It's been way too long. Now, for those who don't listen to Scathing Atheist, who maybe didn't hear the interview that you did on there, could you tell us really briefly about your new podcast, Data Over Dogma, what that is and and what that's all about? It's just a really cool one. I, I really think our listeners probably get a lot out of it. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I really like it, too. Not because of anything I'm doing, but my co-host, Dan <laughs> McClellan, is an astoundingly knowledgeable Bible scholar, got advanced degrees from Oxford and Exeter University, and is is just so knowledgeable about everything to do with the Bible. So we decided to get together and do a podcast that we, as the name suggests, Data Over Dogma, where it's not devotional, it's not there to, you know, boost anybody's spirit or anything. We're just there talking about what we know about the Bible, what it actually says, you know, he's able to to translate from the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. And it's it's just a really fascinating look at a book that is, regardless of what your actual view on that book is, it's influential. So it's good. Yeah. It's good to have the actual like knowledge about it. Yeah, it's actually because like I'm not the I I hate the fucking Bible. I read it like I hate read the Bible, right? And <laughs> and he makes me interested in it. That's pretty impressive. So okay, so with that out of the way, and with the reminder, of course, that you can check that show out by following the links in the show notes. Dan, tell us what will we be breaking down today. Ah, we watched Witnesses. It's the story of three men who never saw the things they saw, and then bravely never denied that they didn't not see them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's now you don't see it. Now you don't. <laughs> much simpler form of the trick there. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love a historical Mormon films about Twunk Joseph Smith, but they don't include enough absolutely damning details about what a con man he was. You will love this movie. And can I say, I do. Right. I do love this movie. Yeah. Yeah, this one is way more open about the obvious con shit than these stories usually are. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, we have a pattern to Mormon Movie Month, all right? We start you with a nice piece of a historical fiction, right? It's the Mormons being like, and then Joseph Smith fell down a hill into an 11 year old girl. He had no <laughs> choice. <laughs> then we get with the commonaries and the missionary movie. But I enjoyed this one because the movie just kept having to pause and go, I'm sorry, do we want to put that in <laughs> our... He didn't, okay, so you know, he didn't actually pay them back. No, that's true that he didn't pay them back. He couldn't. <laughs> But that's because one guy wanted all of the money. Or just oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it. I can't. That moment, I can't. That's so amazing. Oh man! So, is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Well, I mean, Eli was kind of hinting at it for me, but mine is just best worst. Who is this movie for? <laughs> me, me, Dan. It's it's for, for, it's for Eli. <laughs> Literally, they made a movie for Eli. I didn't. I never saw it coming from the Mormons. But the thing is that. Rank and file Mormons do not know this story. 
they only know like the bare bones whitewashed version of this story. You know, three good men witnessed the golden plates. That's it. But then the internet happened and mm -hmm. now word is getting out about like the deeply problematic stuff. So I guess the filmmakers, like they literally break their backs trying to get out in front of all that shit. And even though they're trying to provide like plausible cover for the disturbing bits, all they're really doing is making ignorant Mormons aware of how messed up their history actually is. So yeah, the Mormons who are looking for a heartwarming devotional film are going to hate it. And it sure as fuck isn't going to convince any non-Mormons to join up. So who the fuck right. is it for? That's the thing is that the arguments are so fucking weak. It's like, well, you're <laughs> certainly not convincing anyone with that. No. It would be like if they rebooted the Ten Commandments and Moses didn't split the sea, but he was like, but you'll notice this area here is a lot more shallow. So <laughs> what do you say? Look, it only comes up to my knees. We can wave. Huh? It's fine. Yes. We'll wave. A schlep? Who, who's a on for a schlep? Sandbar. <laughs> so I was, okay, so I'm going to go with best worst witnesses. The name of the movie is Witnesses. It's the story of the three witnesses at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon. There's a thing that says, you know, the good job. Joseph Smith received these three plates and three people, other people saw the plates. Here are their signatures or whatever, proving that it was real. Now, what that doesn't tell you in the introduction is they saw him spiritually. It was in a vision. They had a vision <laughs> all together in the force. Like not like he he like unveiled them and here they are in this box <laughs> here. Hold those or whatever. And so like everything that they do in this movie is to try to convince you. No, these were like reputable guys. These guys really like they they absolutely saw this shit and everything that they actually tell you in the movie. It's like well yeah these guys are obviously fucking lying though. <laughs> <laughs> to put it this way. If you claim to be a witness to a crime and then when the police were interviewing you, you said, well, I had a vision of him stealing the candy bar from the 7-Eleven. Right. That's illegal. That's how much not a witness it is. It's literal. There's a term. It's called bearing false witness. <laughs> Which I'm guessing they couldn't get the rights to. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And I'm going to go with best worst, Martin Harris. Now, look, I know this is mostly for the Exmos listening to this podcast, but if you don't know who Martin Harris is, he's the fourth stupidest human ever to exist. Yep. And yeah. Mormonism has, I think Dan will agree, a pretty tough time not making it look like Martin Harris <laughs> tripped over his own balls and fell into an outhouse <laughs> at any given second. <laughs> Not this movie. No. Martin Harris from this movie is like, <laughs> I mean, even this movie does him some favors, but yeah. he's still, yeah, he's still the Gomer pile of the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. If someone was like, hey, I want you to roast Martin Harris at Vulgarity for Charity this year, I would ignore it because it didn't feel good. <laughs> All right, well, apparently there's no such fucking thing as a short Mormon movie, so we're going to take a minute to warm up to this one, but we'll be back in a flash with all the ahistorical bullshit of Witnesses. All right, everyone, welcome to the first writer's meeting for Witnesses. Now, as you know, thanks to the Fairness in Mormon Movies Act, which was deceptively passed through the Utah State Legislature, disguised as a sign-up for a potluck, we now have to allow an atheist in our writer's room. Oh, man, I was going to bring funeral potatoes. Me too. Guys, guys, we were all going to bring funeral potatoes. They're awesome, and they almost make Mormonism worth it. But yeah. Anyways, this is no illusions. He's our atheist writer. Hey, guys. I saw him smoking weed out of an apple outside. Don't be silly. I was smoking weed and eating an apple. I'm an adult. Okay, anyway, I thought we'd begin our movie with Joseph secreting the plates away in the night and avoiding those who tried to rob him. You mean the plates that would have weighed 200 pounds? Uh, uh, we, we don't know how much they weighed. Well, yeah, but he described the dimensions and material of the plate. So, like, at minimum, we're talking 140 pounds. Okay, so he's running through the woods with 140 pounds and then... These bad guys, uh, these uh, uh, former accomplices. Uh, sorry, what? They, well, they were his accomplices. They had conned people out of money together. And he stiffed them. 
Remember, um, I mean, that's what they said. Well, I, th them and the victims who also testified that Joseph and those exact men had conned them by claiming they had ancient gold on their property they could dig up. Guys, guys, we're less than a line into the movie. This is going to take forever. I, I, well, I mean, or you guys could just tell the truth, right? And like, let your audience decide. You can put Cheetos instead of breadcrumbs on the top of funeral potatoes. Oh, that sounds so good. They really are. They're really good. Yeah, actually, that no, that does sound good. Oh, my heck. Now I want a funeral. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Dan Beecher. And I'm No Illusions. You know, we had a lot of fun on this week's introductory sketch, but funeral potatoes are no joke. That's right, Noah. Sure, they're delicious mountains of cheesy heaven. But did you know a single scoop of funeral potatoes contains 850,000 calories? It's true. They do. But Dan, they're so flavorful and delicious. I can't resist their siren call. Nobody can, Eli. Nobody can. But that's why there's HelloFresh. What's HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. I don't know, Dan. When I'm not eating funeral potatoes, I like a little variety. Don't those meal kits get a little samey? Don't those meal kits get a little samey? No, not at all. Not at all. HelloFresh gets that you want options when it comes to what to make for dinner. Not just the same old thing all the time. That's why they offer 40 recipes to choose from every single week. So you'll never get bored and can always find something new to try and love. It's true. HelloFresh sent us a box to try when they became a sponsor. The food was easy to cook, unpacked in seconds. It was never boring. That's why I know Illusions personally endorse HelloFresh. All right, guys, I'm sold. Where do I sign up? Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful50 and use code AWFUL50 for 50% off plus free shipping. So I go to HelloFresh.com slash AWFUL50 and use code AWFUL50 for 50% off plus free shipping? That's right. HelloFresh, because man cannot live on funeral potatoes alone. Oh, I wish I could, though. Oh, have you ever had them with corn? Daniel, I will kill everyone you love. Oh, wow. Somebody's mad he can't eat the kind with bacon. Every last person. Wait, they make them with bacon? They do. Oh they God, make them with bacon. It's, it's so the bottom good. layer and they fry. It's so good. I don't like potatoes. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown and we're going to open up on a series of like ever more Mormon production logos. <laughs> <laughs> with the Nephite Historical Preservation <laughs> Society. White and delightsome pictures <laughs> presents. Yeah. It's funny because at one point there was a black background. We had not had any movie yet. And the, it came up with produced by Russell D. Richens, which is such a Mormon name. My Mormon PTSD was kicking in already. We right. had that in a movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so the movies that we get that. And then there's a the movie like, what's by time? Guy lied. That's the plot. They, they <laughs> make it up so well. They're like, well, OK, Joseph Smith existed. Yeah, so it's verifiably <laughs> plates. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is going to be the story of the folks who actually asterisk saw asterisk the plates asterisk, <laughs> hence the name witnesses. Yeah. So we cut to Independence, Missouri. It's 1833 and it's time for some good old Mormon lynching. The first spoken lines, because the rest of the stuff was just like written on screen or whatever. The first spoken line in the movie, I shit you not, is some henchman guy going, get them, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing. I literally paused the movie a half second in before that line was even spoken because it was literally in that half second the three men with torches were already wildly overacting. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. my God. Mm -hmm. Like literally one second in, and I can tell this is going to be, like they were like chorus members from a community theater production of Oklahoma <laughs> trying to get noticed. <laughs> right. And I should point out that Independence, Missouri is a mandatory part of any ahistorical film because it was the one time Mormons were kind of, sort of oppressed, so they can never, ever fucking shut up about <laughs> it. Well, you know. 
they, they'd go in and fuck everybody's daughters until they got quote unquote oppressed. Right. Yeah, so this exactly. happened quite a bit, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so they're torturing the Mormon settlement. They're scaring the Mormons. We cut to David Whitmer. He's going to be a major character. He's one of the three witnesses. We cut to David Whitmer. There's this great moment where his wife is like, I'm scared, David. And he's like, I'm here for you. And then they burst into his house and immediately drag him out. And he's like, I'm not here for you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the moment. Like, she knows he's there. How is it so comforting for him to say, I'm here. I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're there. I'm still very frightened of the mob outside, <laughs> David. Yeah, you were you were there when I said it in the first place. Yeah. So. And if you're wondering, by the way, David Whitmer is the uh, Stuart Sutcliffe of Mormonism, right? Like, not even the four-member Beatles. He's the fifth member of the Beatles <laughs> yeah, right. that was, like, there at two jam sessions. And don't worry, this entire film will be focused on the fact that for the rest of his life, he was like, I ain't no liar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. The reason David Whitmer is at the center of this film, and this is important, is because David Whitmer was by far the most interviewed of the witnesses, of the three witnesses. He would talk to anyone who would talk to him about it. Yes. So they drag him to the center of town, along with a bunch of other people, put a bunch of people on stage, and they go, which of you is David Whitmer? Which you'd think they would have bothered to figure that out before they grabbed it five randos from the town. Yeah, right. Also, if you're hoping for a this I am Spartacus moment, nope, everyone immediately looks at David and he's like, yo, you motherfuckers are snitches. <laughs> I'm David Whitmer. <laughs> I thought maybe there was going to be a unity on the stage, but no, they're all just no, staring this is at just me. Just and, yeah. pointing. I can see you shaking your head my way, guys. So, and, so the bad guy goes to David Whitmer and he's like, did you really see the gold plates? Tell me no, and I won't kill you. You wouldn't die for a lie, would you? Like the apologetic? <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. You know, I more I understand that Mormons love to be oppressed. That that's their favorite narrative in the whole universe. But a firing squad seems a bit much. Yeah. yeah. Right. But so but that's this movie's opening gambit. They're they're like, you know, David Whitmer, even when he thought he would die, if he's if he didn't just admit it was a lie, he still told the truth that, that he had actually seen the plates. But but he didn't die. like David Whitmer lived into his 80s. Right. Right. Wow. <laughs> Spoilers for the next scene of the movie. <laughs> Noah. Whoa. Also, by the way, if anyone ever puts a gun to your head and says, Say this or I'll kill you. It should be an easy call. Yep. I don't care what you're like. Your your God will forgive you. That should always just be an easy call. Okay, I'll say the thing you want yeah. me to say. That's fine. That seems fair. And if your God wouldn't forgive you, he's not your God. That's a shit God. <laughs> he's pretty shitty God. Yeah. yeah. You need a better God. You deserve a better God. So, yeah, so we, we leave that on a cliffhanger. We'll catch back up to that in about an hour and a half. But first, we're going to get the title screen along with the signature of the said witnesses scrolling all its way onto screen, right? Okay, guys, be honest. Look into your hearts. Do you think they made Martin Harris's signature the slowest and the sloppiest as a dig? Or do you think that's... <laughs> No, historically accurate because it it's two signatures like Hester Chesterbaum and then Martin says it's just like a toddler. It might as well be in crayon, just <laughs> Martin <laughs> Howes. Except that they needed to fill time because they opted to go with the Mormon tradition of music that's a hymn sung ten times too slowly. Oh mm -hmm. God! During this uh, this opening sequence, I accidentally muted my computer for a second and I was just like oh that's nice yeah, sure. <laughs> totally an accident yeah we we yeah. all believe that for sure it comes up it's like based on a true story we all write our notes no the fuck it isn't you fucking liar <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's based kind of, I mean there's some truth to some of it I'm some of these sure. people existed <laughs> So, yeah, so then we cut to Richmond, Missouri. It's 1881, 37 years after the martyrdom asterisk of Joe Smith. Yeah, yeah. martyrdom, right. He was yeah. martyred. I, I remember <laughs> in church them talking, like a guy literally correcting me and saying, oh, no, he wasn't murdered. 
he was martyred. Yeah. Uh-huh. As if that was a, like, you know, as a distinction without a difference. Thank you so much. You know, to be fair, martyred rolls off the tongue better than shot to death trying to use the magic powers he didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important that we all acknowledge that Joseph Smith's last words were <laughs> Actually, you've got it a little bit wrong because the, as this movie weirdly acknowledges, though he was in a jail when he was shot, he did have a gun yep. that someone had smuggled he did have into a gun. Yeah, he had a gun. That's true. And he did. So he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't using magic powers. He was literally using a weapon. <laughs> well, I don't think Eli was accusing him of actually using magic powers. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he did the shield. It's fine. It's fine. So, yeah, the no, no, he did. He did, he the did the symbols. He did the hand symbols and shit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we get this dude, this, this reporter guy that's tracking down data over dogma. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> so we get this character. This is Edwin Kelly. He's a reporter and he's tracking down David Whitmer. He's going to frame the whole movie for us. It's all going to be an interview with David Whitmer, right? Oh, my God. And he starts off a tradition in this movie that doesn't really stop, which is act walking. He, he <laughs> Every actor in this new movie needs you to know that every fiber of their being is acting at all moments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what's really funny is that he comes in, he's got this bowler hat and whatever. It's literally just, hi, I'm Charlie Chaplin with the e- evening bugle. Yeah. It's, it's the weirdest thing in the, I don't, yeah, it was very strange. Right. And he, he finds David Whitmer and he's like, you know, I'm from the newspaper and David Whitmer's like, get the fuck out of here. I don't want to talk to you. Da- Again, David Whitmer would talk to literally anyone he could hold down about this shit throughout his life famously right but they have to have the whole like but will he but won't he (laughs) well and to be clear they need to introduce the fact that david whitmore was actually interviewed several times during his life by people who were like yeah he's full of shit his story is (laughs) full of holds like he keeps making shit up and getting Mm -hmm. shit wrong and we have to correct him on the record so the way they introduce themselves is david whitmore being like I don't know. That other reporter sure was Jewish. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm extra gullible. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. Uh huh. So, but he kicks the guy out and then the, the reporter starts to leave, but then Whitmer takes out his box of exposition cues and decides to do a movie after all. Right. Oh my God. The the reporter had asked him, did you really see an angel? And I was so hoping that Whitmer was going to open the box and an angel was going to come out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no dice yeah no instead he pulls out a letter he starts reading it it's the letters like you have three days to get the fuck out or I'm sorry you have three days to get the fuck out governor That's- uh, it was so weird what the <laughs> fuck was with the cockney <laughs> accent I don't know it's supposed to be a Mormon and it comes back later in the movie it was just this random there's no explanation ever Mm-mm. but suddenly it's like oh no you're going you, you definitely haven't made it into this you're, you're out of all religion that's for sure yeah, it was, so, yeah. That guy was like talking to his agent. He was like, no, I know it's only one line, but trust me, no small parts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I will the- be remembered. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but then he calls back the reporter guy. He's like, come on back, reporter guy. It's Mormon movie month after all. Right. <laughs> so we cut to Palmyra, New York. It's 1827. We see this actor and right away. I'm like, wow, he's significantly better looking than any of the other actors we've seen. I bet that's Joseph Smith. <laughs> okay. If Mormon Movie Month has given us anything, it is Mormons getting more and more confident over time at how much they can lie about how Joseph Smith looks. <laughs> yes. Right? Because, like, when we started doing the early A historical films, you know, they'd clean up a little bit of the acne. They'd make him the same height as everyone else. But now he's just fucking Jim Caviezel yeah. fucking descending down from the clouds, <laughs> chopping down trees with his jawline. <laughs> I think this may have been our cutest Joseph Smith. Oh, I think, for sure. I think he oh. may have been the best looking. The twunkiest. And he he starts another tradition in this movie, which is the anachronistic haircut, because he's gone full yes. Bieber. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. For sure. It's weird. I wonder what pomade they had in 18, whatever the fuck. <laughs> right, right. It was so fun. And it's fun. if you look at pictures of the three witnesses, they have some wackadoodle hair. So mm-hmm. it's very yes. sad 
that we didn't get that much. If they had given me that much historical accuracy, I would have been on board for this movie the entire way. I might have been a Mormon. I'll tell you what. I don't <laughs> care how you cut this guy's hair. I'd still fuck him. So. Yep. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but now this is the scene where uh, Joseph Smith gets the plates and he has to get it home, but all the brigands are waiting for him along the way. So this is like a, like an opening action sequence of Mormonism, right? And we mentioned it in the opening sketch, but it is worth pointing out that at minimum, these plates are 140 pounds because <laughs> Joseph couldn't stop lying about their dimensions. And so mm -hmm. if they were actually gold, they would be, again, at least 140 pounds. Probably closer to 200. Yes. And Joseph Smith had a lifelong limp, which they got rid of for this movie, a la right, Kaiser. Yeah, right, so right, so, right. No, so it makes it a lot easier. So him fucking back flipping around with these plates, we make it zero seconds into the backstory of this movie before we're like, and there's the lie. Yeah. Well, and I love the fact that he has he is retrieving these plates from, you know, listen, when you're the Lord's anointed and you're hiding the most precious treasure the world has ever known. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Probably just under some bark is fine. Under some bark, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, obviously. It's not like gold glints and is visible. And Eli's barely fucking exaggerating when he says he backflips his way around with these fucking things. This is a, like a full, this is like the, their version of the opening of uh, Casino Royale. Oh, yeah. Right? The parkour <laughs> scene or whatever. It's forest parkour all the way. He is, <laughs> he is bouncing off of trees, clonking dudes on the head. He is... <laughs> And he's a ninja. He keeps yes, he's, like he's, he's fucking Batman at a certain point. <laughs> yes. He's popping up where he you know, he was over there and now he's over here. Yeah. Him and an angel do like an arm swing kick on two guys' <laughs> faces. Ding. Smoke bomb. Well, at one point he actually knocks one motherfucker out with the golden plates. I was like, that would be like having a scene in a Jesus movie where he starts swinging the cross around like Jackie Chan with the ladder and <laughs> first strike or something. What the fuck are you guys doing? Come on. Oh, there were two Roman guards after Jesus got done with them. <laughs> Be better. Radioactive. Radioactive. <laughs> so so yeah, so he he knocks out the bad guys. He checks to make sure he didn't get any brigand blood on the on the gold plays. He didn't. And meanwhile, we we cut back to the to the interview for a second, and the you know and the and the interviewers going like, yeah, man, I thought you were going to tell me a story about you seeing an angel and you started it six years earlier with a guy in a karate <laughs> fight. Uh, <laughs> so so Joseph Smith gets home. He gets back to the Smith household. Everybody's waiting. He stumbles in and he's all beat up and stuff because of the, you know, the action sequence on the way in. And he goes, he says, he's got this bundle. It's all wrapped up in a cloth. And he's like, these are golden plates. And before you ask, no, you cannot visually verify that fact. I promise God. <laughs> well, what I think is so funny about this scene is it's a series of people like getting drawn in like Apu the monkey in the big red stone <laughs> in the beginning of Aladdin. <laughs> and Joseph has to be like, no. The entire Smith family were con men, right? The real story of this is Joe got home and he was like, oh, I'm telling everyone those are gold plates. Don't fuck around with it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I had to run so far with that thing that wasn't made of gold because I couldn't have done it because I have a lip. <laughs> well, he's, got this, he's, he's got this very, it's like basically a muslin like hobo sack mm -hmm. filled yes. with something rectangular. Yeah, uh-huh. And that, that little prop of a muslin sack with a rectangular contents, it makes it so much in this movie, which makes the contention of the movie so much weirder that these these plates keep moving around and we keep seeing them, but no one's allowed to just lift the, the fabric a little bit. Right, right. Even the people who are allowed to see them are never allowed to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You sympathize with Mormon kids thinking soaking isn't sex when you hear that this is the origin <laughs> of their religion. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I think if my faith started with you can touch the outside of the bag, I too would think the dick is in the vagina, but someone's jumping on the bed counts. Like, yeah, I get no. it. <laughs> Well, but even the movie, has, but that's the thing. The movie keeps acknowledging this shit, right? Because we back away from this scene at the, at the Smith household for the reporter to say to David Whitmer, okay, why does this sound exactly like it would sound if it was a lie? <laughs> right? <laughs> I just love, I love that Whitmer, the whole time the reporter's there, 
is randomly whittling a this wooden box. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I there's just a, I I just get such a kick out of him. Just it's his precious wooden box that holds his like most precious items. We find out later. Mm-hmm. And as he's talking to the reporter, he's just like sort of randomly like just carving into it, poking at it. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's like desperately trying to get the reporter to say, "So what's in the box?" <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. So, okay, so we, we cut back to the flashback and like everyone is now gathering because they've heard about the gold plates, but Joseph won't show anybody where they are. And the, the, the narrator's like, yeah, no, he had to constantly move the plates around. Like anytime you would look in the place that he said that they were, it would turn out that he had just moved them that morning to a different place. So, yeah, they moved a lot. <laughs> the actual line that he says is people came from every creek and hollow to see the plates, which is why early Mormonism was populated mainly by trolls and hobbits. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's fair. Which maybe explains Martin Harris's chin beard. I was I'm not just sure. about to ask which Martin Harris was. Yeah. So this is where we meet Martin Harris. Martin Harris is there to help Joseph Smith. And he's like, man, you want me to help you hide your place, but I'm not even allowed to see him. He's like, no, you are allowed to only hold the box and verify that there is weight in it. He's like, well, there's, Really, only one or two ways to have weight in a box, and gold plates is one of them, so I believe. (laughs) (laughs) He picks up the box, and he goes, well, it would have to be either lead or gold, and I'm like, ah, the famously intuitive fucking metallurgist Martin Harris has signed (laughs) off on this. Not only that, he picks it up with such ease that he's he's like, oh, no, that's either lead or gold or feathers or something. I don't know, man. (laughs) There's a pound of feathers or a pound of baseballs in here. I, know, I don't know which it is. And they have this weird meta moment where he's like, I mean, I don't know whether to believe you, but your family all tells the same story. And Joseph Smith is like, we rehearsed it. We are a bunch of known con people. And he's like, what? And he's like, sorry, I'm doing a, I'm just doing a swoosh out of the doodly do. Yeah, yeah, right, that's a right. Little... Well, but that's the thing. Why would Martin Harris say this? Like, so nobody doubts that the story, Joseph Smith came in with an unidentified bundle of shit under his arm, right? Nobody's denying. And then, but Martin Harris is like, wow, it's amazing how consistent everyone's account of you coming in with an unidentified bundle of shit under your arm is as though it's not a lie at all. Right? Like, who are you you talking to, Martin? It's so funny because every line of this movie up to this point and beyond was written to try and ward off some version of a criticism. Yep. It's, I don't, the whole movie is so fucking defensive. I don't know how you write a movie from the (laughs) defensive position, but it's apparently possible. Like this. Yeah, this is an exemplar. Yeah. So, okay, and then we get, like, old-timey David Whitmer. We have to introduce him to the story. He wants to go see Oliver Cowdery, another character we haven't introduced to the story, to learn more about these golden plates that he's hearing so much about. Right, Right. and what's amazing about this, and this is probably confusing if you're not a Mormon or at least sort of aware of Mormonism by a terrible curse of your profession like we are, the reason why they're introducing David this early in the story, even though he doesn't show up this early in the timeline, is they want to make the three witnesses seem equal. But actually what happened is that Whitmer got conned kind of last minute by Oliver Cowdery. So they're trying to make it seem like, yeah, there was Oliver Cowdery, there was Martin Harris, and then there was... I also existed during yeah, the right, time right. period of these events. <laughs> well, and the other reason, of course, is because they have to pretend that he's this major part of the story since he was the one willing to say it over and over and over again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we cut to David and Oliver having dinner, a nice little dinner. Well, it, by the way, this dinner, they, you know, David has to get permission from his wife to go off and see Oliver and this when they get away from their wives, suddenly it is candlelight in the restaurant. This oh, is, yeah. This begins a very long through line of this movie, which is the obvious and very palpable sexual tension Absolutely. In, uh, between yeah, all no. of the men. There's a real love by angle. Yeah, no, I was going to say between Oliver and everyone he ever shares a scene with, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so David's like, so Oliver, did you did you see the plates? He's like, no, no. He's like, did you talk to someone who saw the plates? He's like, no, I talked to somebody whose cousin's uncle's former roommate held them in a box once. <laughs> and they're like, well, we should go see Joe ourselves, darn it. And 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 then they don't. And we don't hear from either of these characters for another 25 fucking minutes. No, no, we're not in the story yet. It would be cool if we went and saw him now. 
<laughs> but no, um, the only one who was stupid, I mean, loyal enough Lucky for this enough. part of the story <laughs> was Martin. <laughs> Literally, if any of this story was told sort of quasi sequentially and with any kind of story, this would have been a a half the length movie than it is. Yes. But they keep bouncing back and forth in time and it's, it is wildly confusing. I don't know who could understand this movie. Certainly, if you are not raised and sort of ensconced in Mormonism, you are not going to understand anything that happens. In There's this so many just yeah. random characters that show up for no fucking reason. Yeah. So, okay. So, meanwhile, Joey's just translating away. The, the narrator cuts in and he's like, you know, Joseph Smith had been given interpreters by the angel. Never mind what form they took. Doesn't really matter what form they took. They just were interpreters. Uh, Don't buddy. worry about what the interpreters were or what they did. <laughs> no, they're they're not people. They're just uh, they they may be they may be glasses made out of rocks. Don't they worry know. about it. <laughs> <laughs> or both. Yeah, I love. This scene, this is the first time we see him actually doing the interpreting, and the movie doesn't have the courage to put his face all the way in the hat. Yeah, right. Which is again, like the actor, you could see him, he's kind of hovering around the hat, and I'm like, put your face in the hat, pussy. You know what it did. <laughs> Get it in there. Put your face in the hat. And just so that we know that Joseph Smith is, in fact, an action hero, we have another quick scene of like a bunch of people show up to try to steal the plates. And the family has to defend them by yelling really loud and shooting up in the air like they were trying to scare off coyotes. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. Banging trash cans. Literally yeah. yelling and shooting indiscriminately. Just <laughs> It's Yosemite <laughs> Sam forms of uh, <laughs> protecting your land. Yes, exactly. So then, okay. So then Joe and his wife moved to, to Pennsylvania. His first, his first. His prime wife. No reason. <laughs> they just felt like moving. They just to wanted to. They they wanted to change the scenery, like you often enjoy the fine do. state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> and then they show Martin doing the translating here. This is um, this is where they first introduced the curtain that Joe had to keep between Martin, lest he see the very real gold plates that definitely exist, mm -hmm. which are on the desk but still in the sack. So. Just, lest anyone be confused that he's actually looking at the source no. material as he's as he's quote unquote. <laughs> he's looking at the magic rock in the hat. Was the movie now allowed to see the gold plates? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. So we, we cut to that. They they're like taking a break. They're sit standing by the river. Joseph is skipping stones, and Martin's like, "Gee, man, I sure wish that I could look into the hat and see the magic rock." And he's like, yeah, I probably wouldn't work if you did it, though, because you're not um, beloved enough by God as I am. So it probably wouldn't work for you. Oh, OK. OK. Can I look at one of the stones? No. No. Can I do <laughs> no. literally anything that would serve as proof? Or even no. evidence? No. No. <laughs> no. I love the moment. It's funny because he there's a moment where Martin Harris picks up a rock. And I was like, I wrote, hey, Joseph, I found a rock, too. Can my rock be a seer stone? But little did I know, that's what <laughs> yeah, was about to that happen. That is coming, yep. Yeah, no, so th they have this scene, and this is so fucking funny if you know any of the history at all, as as, as Dan's already pointed out. They, they present Martin as this wily skeptic, right? So as soon as Joe turns his back, Martin swaps out the magic rock with just a regular rock that looks like it that he found by the river. And then Joe turns back and he looks in his hat and he's like, what's going on here? My rock isn't working. And Martin's like, oh, yeah, I was just checking, just double checking, make sure. And we, but yeah, you're sure your magic is legit. Right. Because nobody could look into a, into a hat that they've been staring into for days on end and go, <laughs> oh, that's not the same rock. That's, that's a, a different, different rock. rock. <laughs> Although I do love and wish more of religious canon was filled with people just trying to pull a switcheroo, right? Like, <laughs> and then Hephi did grab Moses's staff and say, let me see that thing. I bet there's just a <laughs> snake in a secret compartment or something. <laughs> Erg, erg, he struggled trying to tear the staff apart to find the secret compartment. And lo, he said unto him, it's under his, his tunic. Look under the tunic. Yes. I love that they keep portraying Martin Harris as the skeptic here. Mm -hmm. That dude was the most credulous simpleton oh, in yes. the world. He was a nutball. He would believe anything anybody said to him. 
He had already switched religions at least five times before he met Joseph. Yes. Yeah. Literally, uh, one of his friends said, I was looking it up, and uh, there's a quote where one of his friends said of him, Martin was a good citizen, but he was a great man for seeing spooks. He literally saw, like he he thought a flickering candle was the devil's work. He constantly Jeez. saw <laughs> ghosts and demons. Yep. It, and as this movie will point us, spoiler alert, his wife later had to sue him to <laughs> stop giving his money to idiots. Yeah. yeah, She had to be like, okay, fine. I guess we're going to court in the 18 aughts and I'm going to win because you're so fucking stupid. It's <laughs> amazing. So yeah, so but Martin's like, yeah, sorry, Joseph. I just wanted some evidence that you weren't completely just lying to me since I'm giving you all my money and paying all your bills and shit. And he's like, mm, wanting evidence that makes you a bad person. He's like, it does. Uh -huh. I know, I know it does. And then, so we cut. So we cut to like later on. Martin is looking over all of the lovely come to passes that he's translated. <laughs> Emma comes in. She's very, very pregnant. And Martin explains to her that he really wants to show his wife the Book of Mormon because she thinks that he's getting taken for a fucking ride. And if only she could see how awesome this book was, she would be convinced that it must come from God. Right? Yeah. This is the scene where both Emma and Joseph just separately launch into, dude, your wife is a total bitch. You know that, right? Yes. <laughs> it is so fucking amazing. And she is literally the hero of the story. Martin Harris's wife is the hero of this entire story. Lucy. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's amazing. Absolutely. I want Lucy's fucking book. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and, and I should point out here that over and over again, Martin keeps saying, you know, I just need some proof. I want proof. All I need is proof. They never use the word evidence, though the latter is more descriptive of what he's asking for. Yeah. Right. Right. Because because even if Joseph Smith produced gold plates, that doesn't prove that he was given them by an angel. That's just evidence. Right. Also, I just have to point out in Martin's defense, I guess. Martin never asked for proof. He'd just come home from a busy day of Bible translating and Lucy would be like, oh my fucking God. Okay, will you at least ask this? And he was like, there's a ghost behind you. And she was like, oh man, it's a mirror. It's a fucking mirror, Martin. Oh my God, why don't Tums exist yet? I need a Tums. <laughs> But Joe comes in and he's like, yeah, you know, I prayed to God about it. And he says, it's OK that if you share your if you share the first couple of chapters, like on a like a shareware model with your with your wife, God said, that'll be fine. Here's a list of the people you can show them to. That's it. Right. So we cut to Martin reading the Book of Mormon to his family. Everyone's quite enthralled. Right. Mm. Yeah, because it is, if nothing else. A super engaging book. Oh, oh yeah. No, so it's, good. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, we don't know. That might have been the really good part. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we never <laughs> saw this part, did we? <laughs> this part goes away. And so now we're going to like, we have, we get this sort of splice cut thing where where Emma is in labor and she's going to have, the, the, the baby is going to be stillborn. And at the same time, Lucy is going to be stealing the Book of Mormon chapters from Martin. The question is, is Emma in labor or is she trapped in a basement by Jigsaw? Because her Ooh. acting was very, very strange. <laughs> yeah. She looked terrified. Yeah. Yeah. As you say, no, no real difference for this actor. But now we should point out because the movie doesn't that what actually happened here is Lucy took those chapters and she's like, well, if you translated these from some other thing, you should be able to write exactly the same thing again. Right. Can you do that? And, <laughs> yeah. and he couldn't. Right. Well, yeah. And, and better still is she went to she was like, tell Joseph you lost the pages and then he'll reproduce the exact same text. And this is how fucking stupid this story is. Joseph was like, oh, God is mad. So we got to tell the same story, but a little bit different. And Martin is so stupid. He was like, I can't believe I lost the page. Yes, right. he forgot. He forgot, Martin forgot that he did not, in point of fact, lose the pages. It's so dumb. Yes. Yeah, but of course, in the movie, it's just that, you know, Lucy is super jealous of, of Martin for getting all of these awesome revelations that, that she doesn't get. And of course, this is also the first time the movie ever mentions, like, oh, yeah, also he's living, like, Joseph Smith is living off of Martin's inheritance at this point, too. Right? Yeah. Which was true. Yeah, that's, exactly. Right. That's fact. <laughs> 
So then we cut to Joe burying his stillborn baby. There's this great scene where Emma's like, this does not seem like a uh, guy who talks to God kind of fate. I got to be honest with you. I don't feel like God <laughs> normally, you know, picks a favorite and then kills their unborn child. Right. Hey, um, Joe, I just because I'm going to feel like an idiot if I don't ask. Um, a lot of people in this mythos have raising the dead powers. Um <laughs> You don't have raising the dead power. Oh, oh no, okay. So I just thought I <laughs> should I ask. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, I, I mean, it's a good question. Did he even try? Right. I mean, if you're su if you're suddenly God's new fuck boy with all this magic and stuff, wouldn't you spend every spare minute just trying shit out to see what power like right. literally walk over to a pond and just check? To see if you can walk out onto it. I don't know. All right. So, okay. Well, I know he's given. He's given people that power before. Yeah. Yeah. To fucking Emma's like Peter did it. I wanted Peter to be like her friend's husband that always does shit better than him. But she means the apostle. God, enough about Peter already. Oh. Jeez. Look at their lawn. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, an angel just said you suck. What? That's, that's <laughs> what an angel said. We can't go see your mom. <laughs> So we check back in. So, so Joseph is moping back at his house. We check back in there and Martin Harris has shown up, but he's sitting outside like gathering himself to tell Joseph the bad news about the missing pages. Right? Oh my God. He is sitting on a log waiting for someone that he can tell about how life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> this whole scene. Have you ever watched children play pretend but it gets too intense. So you have to kind of get in there, right? Because they'll be like, he killed my laser pony. That's right, what's yeah. happening. But there's a religion based on it. And right. they have yes. $7 yes. trillion dollars of hidden money. <laughs> now. So finally, Martin comes in. Of course, Joseph is still upset about his uh, the, the the miscarriage and everything. And he's like, and Martin's like, I, I have to tell you this, this terrible fact i i've lost my soul and everybody's like what and he goes i mean by soul i mean the first couple chapters of that book that we wrote together oh my god and everyone is so dramatic in this scene yes it reminds me of my of like high school acting class where anyone will take any excuse to yell or cry in a scene yeah right oh. <laughs> god is so fucking magical Where's the miracle of decent actors in a religious movie? That's what I want to know. There you go. But also, like, the, the movie just completely, like, skips over the fact that this would not be a big deal if you weren't just making shit up. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is not the scene in Misery where she sets the thing on fire. This is a copy. Right. At least in their stupid fucking religion. But Joe is like, no, God's mad. So he won't let me translate that part anymore. Oh, <laughs> and then Martin runs away. Oh my so god. Fun. This is the funniest thing. Keep, <laughs> there is really truly take a moment in your head and imagine the words run away in the funniest <laughs> fun. That's how Martin it's runs speed away. Wild. I think an entire football stadium worth of people showed up to yell run forest. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. There is no I put in my notes I'm like there's no word to describe the way he's running, and if there was, it would be some kind of Susian onomatopoeia, like poinking or some he poinked <laughs> away or some. Well, I'll tell you what, I feel like we're all super jealous of Martin's ability to just run away from this movie. So we're gonna give ourselves a quick break, but we'll be back in a minute with even more witnesses. Radioactive, radioactive. Hey, hey Eli. Eli, you got a second? Oh, hey Noah. Hey Dan, uh, what's up? Eli. There's no easy way to put this, but you have to stop listening to Imagine Dragons. You have a problem, dude. What? No, I don't. I just enjoy their music. No, you don't, Eli. Nobody does. Yeah, yes, I do. Their lyrics are actually really interesting, and Dan Reynolds isn't even raising his kid Mormon, so if I don't Eli, have to feel... listen to yourself. You need to confront this. No, it's not my fault. It's, it's the Raycon wireless earbuds. Your Raycon wireless earbuds. Yeah, they come with three customizable sound profiles, noise isolation, and awareness mode. Plus, Raycons have a 32-hour battery life, including eight hours of straight playtime. So you can listen to them when you want, what you want, for a really long time. You know, so maybe I have listened to Radioactive five or six hundred 
times. No, this, this is what I'm talking about, Eli. Those must have cost you a fortune. No, Noah. Raycons start at half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. Create your own soundtrack with Raycon. Right now, God Awful Movies listeners get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash gam. That's buyraycon.com slash gam to save 15% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash gam. All right, Eli, but we're watching you. Like a criminal. Okay. <laughs> Martin, David, Oliver, it is time for you to see Revelation. Hallelujah. Amazing. We three shall kneel here in this grove and pray with open hearts for God to give us a sign. And then, my brothers, the angel shall reveal himself to you. Oh, that's so cool. Um... Uh, in what order? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, brother Martin? Oh, I, j I just wanted to make sure we weren't doing this in a specific order that maybe you forgot to mention. No, we we shall all pray together for divine revelation. Oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. It's just, I, I, I don't get me wrong. Super excited to see God or whatever, but I'm just worried he's gonna get here and be. Not that sight to see, David. Wait, what? Uh, Why? Look, no, no offense, David, but you like just got here, and I'm, I'm worried the angel's gonna show up and be like, "Who's this guy?" You know, and so maybe we should do like a seniority based system. Like, I'll meet the angel. Maybe he and I do a quick Q and A. You follow each other on Insta, and then Oliver meets him. Maybe Oliver gets a photo. And then David, David gets like a handshake on his way out, like a Comic-Con line type thing. No, you know, no, keep... no, Brother Martin, we shall all meet the angel at once and as equal brothers in the sight of God. Okay, but won't we say equal, though? Yes, yes, Brother Martin, equal. Do I come out now? Damn it, Hiram, not yet. Costume is hot. Damn it, Hiram. <laughs> <laughs> And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with the interviewer prompting the next scene of the flashback because the screenwriter is lazy. <laughs> right? Oh, and this is where he, he <laughs> provides the apologetic that I've heard many Mormons say, which is basically that, like, Joseph Smith was too uneducated and stupid. He was way too big of a blithering, drooling idiot to actually write a book. A whole book? <laughs> he couldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah, he, they go like a man with no education that could barely compose a letter wrote this entire book. And I'm like, anyone who read it will tell you yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, literally a 500 page book where the phrase it came to a pass appears an average of almost three times a page. Yeah, I can believe an uneducated man wrote that. If you make people read the Book of Alma and then ask them to describe the author, they accidentally describe an uneducated, blithering idiot named Joseph Smith. <laughs> Who can't compose a letter. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's the worst fucking book ever. Oh. Also, not for nothing, They that apologetic really falls down when you realize he's not supposed to have written the book. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's just dictating it like literally anybody can do that you just have to be able to read the rocks well but and then you move beyond that right like the your your apologetic is the founder of your religion is too stupid to write a book right right <laughs> i don't know what you're trying to defend my here. confidence is absolutely top notch now <laughs> yeah i mean to be fair Nobody is dumb enough to write the Book of Mormon is the truest of the Mormon apologetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just going about it in the wrong direction. All right, so, but eventually we fucking wood chop our way back into the, the flashback. Joey has forgiven Martin for losing all of his, his pages. God said, we won't retranslate that stuff. We're going to rephrase, we're going to paraphrase that part of the <laughs> translation yeah. now. This is also when he gets his Oprah moment and he's like, and you get to see the plates. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. He says you and, and God told me, Martin, that you get to see the plates. And Martin's like, really? Can you show let later? Eventually. Someday. Someday. We're going to do a sticker chart. And when God sees that you have 
10 sunny days in a row, <laughs> you get to see the plane. Are you sure? Because they're right there. I've got my sister working on a paper mache plates thing. You got to yeah, wait right, until it's right. dry first. Fucking Hiram's in the back working on the uh, angel costume. So. Meanwhile, we've got <laughs> we've got uh, David Whitmer, Lulu Lewin back at the farm where his very normal Christian dad, who's not sure about this Mormon thing, shows up and he's like, hey, you got another one of these letters from that thing that you're heavily involved with from the very beginning. And he's like, right. Yes. Letter from Oliver. Thank you, dad. Yes. I am very much participating. Yes. A letter from your friend, Oliver. Yeah, his, <laughs> his, his dear good friend Oliver. Yeah, his pal Oliver. Well, and, and this is the laziest they ever managed to squeeze David into the plot, right? Because what they're doing here is like they're introducing Oliver to the story. This is where Oliver shows up and he's boarding with the Smith household, and the Smiths like send him over to help Joseph, right? But the way that they introduce that is. Oliver writing a letter to David about the fact that he's being introduced to the story. <laughs> so, Dear David, love I'm Oliver. in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we cut to Oliver and Oliver comes in like the, you know, the Smith family is all like talking about the golden plates. And then he walks in and they're like, Oh, shut up. Shut up. And he's like, Oh, just so you know, guys, I, um, I would like to help Joseph Smith with his con. I mean, religion. Yeah. I would definitely play along. I mean, believe in it. Wink. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he literally says that he says something about I, I've i seen the plates. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've dreamed about them. I mean, I'm lying. I haven't seen them, but I did. <laughs> I, don't worry. I, I believe all this stuff pretty, pretty much. Right. Might as well come over and run his finger along the banister. Um, Mom says, you have to let me be a part of your religion or you have to stop playing. And I get to, and I get to be controller number one. Yeah. You can't <laughs> hog the religion the whole time. Right. You've had it since the very beginning of the movie. So, yeah. So they're like, all right, Oliver, you too can be taken advantage of. And he's like, hooray. So they go to see Joseph. Oliver offers to scribe for him. He's like, oh, good, because Martin fucking sucks. Yeah. He's so it slow. So and I mean, dumb. I need it. I need it because of, you know, the, uh -huh. but he, it's, he's constantly looking up and being like, how do you spell cat? And I'm just like, Martin, come on, man. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oliver, you don't have a meddling wife, do you? Because yeah. Right, this isn't going right, to work. Yeah. That's the new rules to the clubhouse is no <laughs> wives who ask questions. And this is also the first time we get the full blown hat looking, right? The full face uh -huh. in hat moment. Yeah. Get it in there. Get right? it in there. And I got to say, uh, David Whitmer is going to be mad because the sexual tension between Oliver and Joseph oh. is thick. Mm -hmm. oh. I wrote it later in my notes. I'm like, I know this is a Mormon movie, so the two of these men aren't going to fuck. But if I was making a movie where the two of these men fuck, it would be exactly the same. Yeah, this is right? the yeah there is no difference. Have, yeah. That is the same movie. Yes. I feel like the guy who played Oliver, just like everyone had a huge crush at him in the BYU drama club, but he was just never telling anyone who he had a crush on. You yeah, know what right, I'm saying? Right. <laughs> you know, the truth is, if you had crazy, like, hundred air money, you could actually make those scenes happen. We could cut. Ooh, we could, I think you're right. We could get those actors. We could, we we can could get splice those it actors. back in. We could do it. There you go. Dan can find give us the personal average addresses of those actors on air. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so that is... Actually, probably true. I know most of the people in this movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so fucking Joseph's going down on that, giving cunnilingus to that fucking hat, right? Doing his translation. Fun fact, I according to the only review of this on IMDb, the Mormon church used to excommunicate people for admitting that he translated by sticking his face in a hat. <laughs> now it's in the fucking movies. Yeah, they didn't like that. No, uh, -uh. but we learn here that Oliver can scribe the shit out of some Book of Mormon. Oh, yeah. And then in the next scene, we learn that Lucy is suing them for being frauds and stealing <laughs> all of Martin's fucking money. <laughs> I can't believe the movie admits this lawsuit exists, but <laughs> instead they claim that it was like the divorce trial between her and Martin. Yeah, they don't make it clear at all what the lawsuit is. Just she's suing. Uh, could be anybody, really. Yeah. She's just suing somebody for something. She's just suing in general, and it's because she's a meanie. 
She's <laughs> such a bitch. <laughs> Once again, she proves that she's the smartest person in the whole story. It is amazing. Yeah, she's going to do that a couple more times here in Act 2. And then there's this amazing moment, which again, why would you keep this in the fucking movie? Where Martin says, hey, Joe, you know, I'm being sued. If you showed me the gold plates like you've already promised to do, that would really be helpful for me in this <laughs> lawsuit where I could stand to lose a lot of my property and money. And uh, and he's like, no. <laughs> and and Martin's like, but right, but you promised. And 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 Joseph's like, yeah, I do that a lot, man. I just yeah. you're gonna have to get used to that shit. <laughs> okay, what what should I do in the only trial where it will be exposed the full extent in which I've been taken advantage of? Well, Martin. You get up there and you tell everyone how stupid you are for the whole world to see. Okay. Okay. Shout it into the historical record. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, right. Carving it into stone. Yeah. So then we cut to this incredibly sexual scene where Joe and Ollie are baptizing each other. Oh, my baptizing God. Baptizing the shit out of each other. Oh. It sounds like a euphemism, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so and, and so we get that. We get uh, a shot where we establish that Emma sure does love and support Joe and takes no issue whatsoever with the work he's doing, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is where he tells, uh, he tells, Joseph tells Emma that, Oliver also has magic god powers now that he he prophecies. Yeah, yeah, they are filling each other up with the Holy Ghost. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, with Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. Holy Ghost. And then the movie's like, oh, this is kind of boring. I guess we need some action. So some bad guys come in and throw shit at them. <laughs> hey, Joe, what? Why were the bad guys there? Bad guys came and threw shit at him. That's all no you need to know. No reason, just because they hated more. Again, keep in mind that this is the movie admitting for the second time that people kept riding up to the Smith house to be like, motherfucker! Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Without, without ever even attempting to explain why, right? It's right. just they just hate the Mormons. Yeah. Well, and it's so funny because there's not even a book yet. Like no. there's no Mormons don't exist at this time. Right. There's not a there's no such thing as a Mormon yet. We haven't gotten there, but there are sure people who oppress them. Well, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Or at the very least, people who throw shit at Joe Smith. <laughs> so then we cut to the trial and this trial scene is fucking delicious. Chef kiss after chef's kiss. So <laughs> we, we start off with one of Joseph Smith's former accomplices admitting in a fucking court that we still have a record of that Joseph Smith told him that he just had a box full of sand that he was telling people a golden Bible was in. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it is actually, it's a little bit worse than that. He was originally in on the con. Yes. He was like, yeah, no, he cut me out of this con. So I'm, te I'm telling, <laughs> I tattle on you now, Joseph. Right. And this guy actually was arrested in association with another con that Joseph Smith was arrested in association with, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And they're just like, Pfft. I was watching this scene. And at one point I was like, wait a minute, considering the fact that literally nobody has even come close to seeing the golden plates. Am I, am I to assume that the title witnesses just refers to the people who were subpoenaed for this trial? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of subpoenas, we also get their fucking insane defense of Joseph Smith not showing up to this trial here. <laughs> yeah. Which is there's this very dramatic moment where they're like, hey, where's your client? This is not the weird divorce hearing of Martin Harris or whatever the fuck they think it is. <laughs> this is This is about whether or not your guy's a fraud and the lawyer's like, Joseph Smith will come <laughs> if we legally make him. Right. right. Yes, he's willing to come if he absolutely has to and doesn't have a choice about it. <laughs> he's ready. He'll, he's just hanging out. He'll he come. says you're the one scared of him. His mom won't let him fight, but he wants to. <laughs> and it's great, too, because we cut out of this to the interview. We cut away from the trial for a second to the interview that this that they're framing this with. And the guy was like, he's he's asking David Whitmer. He's like, so this this Oliver guy, he's the one who said that he saw the plates with you. Right. And he's like, yes. And Oliver's integrity is beyond question. And the reporter guy goes, didn't that guy also say he was visited by John the Baptist? And David, old old timey David Whitmer's like, wait, I don't understand what's your point. Why why did why is that the follow up? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> nope, it's fine. I'm just I'm just doing old timey. Be reasonable. That's okay. Gonna <laughs> move mm. forward. 
And then as though David was like, oh, I'm losing him. I'm losing him. All right, better tell him about the stupidest miracle in Mormon history. <laughs> oh, my God. I could not believe that this was. Okay. Yeah. Podcast listener, we're going to play a little game. It's an interactive podcast now. Okay. So here's what happens. David's about to tell the story of he wanted to go see Joseph Smith, but his dad said, you can't go until all the fields are plowed. Now, what is the dumbest miracle that could have happened? <laughs> You just ooh, filled ooh, in. I know. Oh, I know. Uh, Dan, please, please. Is it that the, the, the field is plowed? It is. It is. It's the, actually dumber than that, Dan. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. No, that, that oh, is what you would hope for. What it. if it was three guys who said David hired them showed up yes. and plowed the field? Oh. Well, it's already so fucking lame because he comes out and the dad's like, oh, my God, how did you get all that plowing done? And David's like, I didn't plow the fields. And you're like, oh, God came down and plowed the field. Is that why there's only the one set of footprints or whatever? <laughs> right. But then the sister comes in. She's like, yeah, three guys came and uh, did that this morning. David, didn't you hire them? And David's like, shut up. <laughs> no, I didn't. Are you sure? Because they told me and I later said the shut up. <laughs> I want to be in the movie. <laughs> also, can, can we talk a little bit about the fact that David Whitmer is married and in his mid to late 20s at this point and asking permission from his daddy if he's allowed to go and right before see his, his friend. chores are done? What the fuck is going on? Here? It's, it's like he, his dad's treating him like he's a tween who wants to go to a sleepover, right? But he gets to go. So we see him giddy up in his way on that. We cut back to the trial where Lucy is, is on the stage. Lucy, the, the star of the movie, Martin's, I guess now, ex-wife. And they're going to get the gotcha from her. This is the dumbest, but they almost went with the best, worst gotcha here. <laughs> they get Lucy on the stand and she's like, yeah, Joseph Smith is a con man. And she's like, he's like, really? He stole all your husband's money? She's like, that's right. He conned him out all his money. She's like, but if that's true and he's such a con man, why did you give him money? And then, and this is supposed to be the whole like, oh shit, she's obviously lying because she knows that Joseph Smith is a trustworthy guy or she wouldn't have given him money. But it's like, the argument is if he's really a con man, why does he ask everyone he knows for money and not just this victim? Yeah, it's basically, if he's not really a Nigerian prince, then why did you give him money? Right, why did yes. you Why did you send your money to him? Right. And they ask her, she's like, you know, did, did, did he defraud you out of that money? She's like, well, I mean, no, I, he asked, I gave it to him. And they're like, ah, see, you, you admit he's not a fraud. And she's like, well, he wasn't a fraud that that time. I mean, ki he was kind of a fraud. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. And then they get the judge. The judge decides he's sick of this shit. He'll call his own damn witnesses. Right. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> the ju did the judge need to take a shit or something? <laughs> it feels... <laughs> Feels like Noah trying to wrap up a record because the air conditioner's been off for too long. Look, this is all very good and trial-y or whatever. I do you have anyone who's not gonna talk about Joseph Smith being a fraud at the fraud trial? No. Well, then I think we've all heard what we need to hear here. And oh, look at that, we're finished just in time for Seinfeld. What did <laughs> Yeah, right. So, well, finished. no, and he says, he even says he's like, Well, I'm calling Martin to the stand. And they're like, Can you do that? You're the fucking judge. And and he says to Martin, he's like, Martin, did he steal your money? And Martin's like, No, I gave it to him willingly. He's like, Well, no con man has ever made someone think they gave him the money willingly. Case dismissed. Right. <laughs> Oh, but I got to say before that, I, I sorry to go back in time a little bit. But before that, the prosecutor asks Lucy, isn't it your devious plan to get the court to force Joseph Smith to produce the plates? And I was just like, um, that would solve this whole thing, wouldn't it? Isn't don't mm -hmm. you want wouldn't it, though? your guy to produce the plates and then all this case just goes away and you've won? Wouldn't that be better? Yeah. Right. But they make it they make it like it's this gotcha on her. Like Yeah. Aha. You all you want is it was for all my client Bruce. to produce evidence. Isn't right, that yeah. so? That's the thing. The dastardly deed she was up to was trying to find any shred of evidence that he wasn't a fucking liar at a trial about whether he was a fucking liar. Mm -hmm. Yep. So all right. So we cut back to David. He's giddy up his way all the way to the Smith house. We have this this is 
I'm going to say Joseph Smith's most low-key miracle. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the miracle of kind of sort of knowing what happened earlier in that guy's day? Oh, come on. Come on, Dan. He knew details that only a prophet or stage magician could have known. I know. Literally, I thought he was doing Eli's old act for a Hey, I would never. I might have my act was this slightly entire better book. than this. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? I knew which cards there were and everything. At one point, he's like, and doesn't this person own the hotel? And he's like, oh, I, I don't know that. And he's like, well, I I looked it up and he does. He so does. He does. It, it was the six of diamonds. He goes. He, so this is what he actually says. He's like, wow, how did you guys know I was coming? He's like, well, you know, Joseph prophesied it. He said that you rode all through the night last night and then you stayed at a hotel and left early this morning. He's like, wow, how could he possibly know that? I'm like, you're here. Right. He knows where you started <laughs> and where you are. <laughs> And he knows and that there's a hotel in the middle. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's not like there's a fucking hotel at every exit at this point. <laughs> oh. And when David sees Joseph, he turns into the oh. most aw shucks. You're Joseph. Oh, my God. Right. It's like, dude, you're a. J it's his house. You yeah, you were going to his house. <laughs> So, but there's also this great hagiographical hey, moment where like they all him and uh and Oliver stand around a little while afterwards going, Wow, he's so young and supple <laughs> and yeah. sexy and his ass looks so good in those pants. <laughs> <laughs> so they go, yeah, they're I guess they're getting ready to do the translation or whatever. Joseph hasn't showed up, and he's like, you know, he's just he's the most remarkable man I've ever met. And yet he's just like you and I, he's so approachable, you know? Such a just guy. so girthy and smart and <laughs> perfect and psychic <laughs> and his magic tricks are so good. <laughs> and then, and fucking Oliver cuts in and he's like, you know, also he's uh, friends with Jesus, real good friends with Jesus. Like, he's like, I know, he's really, there. He's uh, that's so cool. This is how I picture everyone talks about me when I'm not around. No, it is, though, it is. Says, this is the dialogue. Yeah. So, so, but Joseph comes in with his box of sand, I mean, plates, and uh, Dave's like, oh, I guess I'll leave unless you're, I'm going to, were you going to, okay, no, I'll leave. I'll leave. I'll <laughs> so, yeah. And then we cut to the same place we already are. I love this. The fucking little title card on the screen comes up and it's like Fayette, New York. And I'm like, we were already in Fayette, New York. You stupid <laughs> motherfuckers. You well, just they're just said proud that. that he hadn't been run out of town yet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> We've been through three towns in the movie. <laughs> That's amazing. But this is the day where Oliver, David, Martin, and Joseph all went out in the woods to pray for God to reveal the golden plates to them in a vision, not in real life, but in a vision, which is even more true if you think about it. <laughs> the golden plates that were in a box in the last scene. Right. Like, literally, we just cut away from them. Fucking open the box, you asshole. Don't. Right. You don't need to go into a forest. To have a vision. Yep. You can, they're right there. Yeah, exactly. This is such lame bullshit. You, can you even fucking imagine your buddy who you are pretty sure has been conning you this whole time? When like, no, I'm going to show you these things. And then he brings you out in the forest. He's like, all right. So if you believe hard enough, you're going to see you. <laughs> Give me a fucking <laughs> break. This is a seven year old lying to you. Are you not seeing it? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, tell me when you see it. Tell me, is it there? We'll wait. Is, you, We'll wait till you see we'll it. We'll just be here. Right. Yes. I just love that this whole thing started with, hey, let's all go into the woods and, you know, kneel down with and each see, other. And everybody on their knees together. And then somebody else. And, and you mean and pray? Yeah. I just, oh. see the uh, yeah, I guess. Yes. I guess pray. Yeah. <laughs> so. There is no amount of sanitizing this sequence of events that doesn't make it obvious bullshit. Right. Because then they don't see the plates. Nobody sees the plates and Martin's like, it's my fault because I have doubt. Let me ploink away <laughs> and maybe you guys will see it. And wouldn't you know it? <laughs> just as, Ma oh, Martin, Martin, just oh. as you talk, turn your yes. You know how you went to go take, you, you, this is crazy, Martin. You will not believe it. Seconds after you exited, we all saw the plates in a vision. <laughs> it's the snuffleupagus yes. of starting a religion. <laughs> It's Michigan J Frog dance again. It's the Rocco of starting a religion. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And also, can we just mention that it is the worst seeing angels special effect of all time? 
Yes. Oh, oh it's yeah. The bright LED like bulb shining on them in broad daylight so that it doesn't really look like much is happening except maybe someone like shined a mirror and caught the sun on their faces or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Put modern headlights in front of them or something. Yeah. Yeah. Though we just that's the thing. We don't see the angel. We don't see the gold plates. We just see them and like a brilliant white light falls upon them or that's it. Right. That's what we see. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then we fast forward to the Book of Mormon being finished. Right. They're like, hooray, Book of Mormon is, 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 is finished. And we back out of the interview for some more, like, how could this book possibly have been written if it wasn't true? Apologetics, right? Which is yeah. so amazing because they're, again, they're claiming that like a 500 page book in, in three months is, uh, is impossible, blah, blah, blah. I actually know pe people write books in 10 days and he's not claiming to have written right. this fucking book. <laughs> it doesn't take that long to just write it down while someone dictates it. Right. No, that's a really slow process, especially yeah. if you have magical interpreters. But that's the thing. First of all, you could not write a less remarkable book, right? If I gave you three months to do it. But the other thing, too, and this is a, an apologetic you constantly hear from the Mormons is like, you know, he wrote that in just three months as though as though to say, well, you could it must have just been translated. He couldn't have written the entire book, 500 pages just by himself in three months or whatever. But it's like, but those three months weren't consecutive. <laughs> The, right, so so what, where they're getting that is that the number of days spent translating is around like 70, 75 or something like that. But that was over a two year period. So it's it's not only is it not an effective apologetic, but it's also a fucking lie. <laughs> Noah, you're being a real jerk right now. Aren't I, okay? though? He, it, took, it was it was three months. You're being you're just stop being <laughs> a dick my, about it. All my data over all their dog. But yeah, right. Uh, right. And then in the interview, right, like. Edwin Kelly says, well, it seems to me that like, you know, that this is obviously bullshit. And David Whitmer is like, well, have you even read the Book of Mormon? And he's like, I no." And he's like, well, perhaps you should. And I'm like, why, though? Right. Like if the story of how it came to exist is very obviously bullshit, why would he then have to read it? I feel like that's a reason not to read it, if anything. Have you read Grey's Anatomy? Don't be a asshole just, <laughs> just don't don't point out that true things don't require a back cover to cover reading right you are and then the, so so we, but we go back into the flashback the narrator's like and would, wouldn't you believe it once the book of mormon was finished joe just kept having revelations and learning new things from god that weren't in the book but were also right. apparently just as important as what was <laughs> very convenient yeah, once joseph realized that anyone was believing his garbage yeah suddenly the revelations came a lot more quickly you think <laughs> yeah if you can believe that yeah he's, and this is where the lord wants them to go to ohio and i'm like no loving god would ever send anyone to ohio this is bullshit <laughs> It's this great moment. And look, this is the story of all post Book of Mormon Mormonism, where like everyone who's in the cult so far is like, are you sure God wants me to go to Ohio? I was really hoping that God would want me to stay. Ohio. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And Joseph's like, no, actually. And you know what? God just said you have to ride in the back. You don't get shotgun anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's what God said. So we cut to Kirtland, Ohio, or as it was known at the time, out west. This is where Sidney Rigdon enters the picture. Yeah. yeah. And hey, can we just say, Sidney Rigdon, fantastic audition for Mormonism, right? Yeah. He's the original bringer comedy club of Mormonism. He's like, hey, hey, Joe, I noticed your con going on here. So I brought my whole congregation, didn't I, everybody? Yeah. Huh? It's amazing. Huh? He literally is on the pulp over the pulpit talking to his congregation. He's like, uh, also bad news, everybody. We're all Mormons now. Yeah. And they're all just like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, guess we no, can do well, that. well, if we're all Mormons now, yeah, I guess we're a different religion. Most of us can't spell, so yeah, whatever, man. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Sydney is he's he's making Mormons left and right, and Joe is like, Sydney, now you have the power of magical prophecy. And David is there. He's like jealous on behalf of Oliver, who apparently up until then was the prophecy guy. <laughs> yeah, it, David is literally like, um, excuse me. Oliver was here first. And uh, yes, 
So, and the narrator cuts in at this point and he's like, you know, that was the first real note of division. And, I've, and I'm like, yeah, you have to point that out because, of course, at this point, like the point that the interview is going on within this movie, David Whitmer was leading his own offshoot religion called the Whitmerite Church that was not <laughs> affiliated with the Mormons. So you kind of have to do it. You do kind of have to address that there was division there eventually. Yeah. If any of you guys at home want to go down a startlingly weird rabbit hole, start looking up the the Mormon offshoots, which start literally a year after mm -hmm. Joseph Smith starts the Mormon church. It is crazy. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. So we get this scene where like uh, Joseph Smith is talking to Emma and he's like, yeah, it's getting really complicated. They're saying that like this other dude has revelations and they're like even better than my revelations. And she's like, well, yeah, but why don't you just have a revelation that his revelations aren't true? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy, Emma. If I say he's full of shit, then he might say that I'm full of shit and I don't have any more evidence than he does. And then we're all in a right. pile of nonsense. You can't just say Things aren't real when you're doing this, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have people thinking about how nothing, none of this shit is real. It's so called <laughs> Yes and, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is I wrote in the notes, oh, why did I tell everybody that they could all have their own revelations? Stupid. <laughs> and then the next scene happened. It's yes. literally that, yeah. Yeah, the next scene is literally David saying, but didn't you say everyone could have their own revelations? And he's like, oh, when I had said that, what I had meant to have said um, when I did <laughs> say that. Yeah. I, look, <laughs> you all can have revelations, but I'm the only one who can tell if they're real or not. So right, yes. You, yes. you have to come to me and then I'll confirm or deny where, just based on what I think. They try to disguise this as like a big dramatic moment where like Joseph Smith is using hyperbole. But I want to be clear that this thing that happens at the end of the scene where he goes, only Joseph Smith is a prophet, just <laughs> Joseph love God, is something that happened during an argument. Right. Yes. So they were arguing about the fate of the church and Joe went, what, what, what? What's that, God? Yes. Only Joseph Smith is a prophet forever <laughs> yes. and ever. Yes. No backseas. He 100% <laughs> does this. And they, the movie is very smart, right? The movie does it as like a, wow, can you imagine if Joseph said, what an interesting thing that Joseph might say hypothetically, yeah. as opposed to like, no, because I was on safe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no taxis, backseas. Yeah. I love that there was a line where Joseph yells, you flirt with apostasy. Yes. And now I'm going to go flirt with a 14 year old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. It's a good thing Joseph Smith wrapped that one up, put a pin in that shit. Mormon schisms are solved once and for all. So I think we can safely take ourselves another break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Can Joseph Smith borrow about 40 bucks until Thursday? Do you doubt the integrity of the Holy Prophet? Why haven't you given him the 40 bucks yet then? Find out the answers to these questions or at least ones just like them when we return for the detrimentally honest conclusion of <laughs> Witnesses. And it came to pass that it came to pass that those who had seen the coming to pass of coming to pass had come to pass and the come to passing which had came to pass had come... Uh, sorry, Joseph... Uh, yes, Martin. What is it? We, we we must finish our translation. Right. Sorry. Um, it's about my wife. Ah, uh, she troubles you once more. Yeah. I see. Martin, what if I were to show you a miracle? Oh, a miracle? That would be amazing. Yes, Martin, for it is I who have got your nose. Oh, <gasps> you do? Yeah. No, look, you can see it right here between my knuckles. Oh, it is? Well, the, what's on my face? Don't check, don't check, don't check, because that's not your nose. It's this over here is your nose. Wow, I didn't even feel you take it. I know, and now your nose is back. Now, can, can we get back to work? Oh, we sure can, Joseph. Wow, my own nose. This is slightly less dumb than the real story. It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And we're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action back at the interview with David Whitmer. Like, Knight's fallen now on their interview. And the interviewer guy is like, okay, so tell me, don't show me the next part. <laughs> you remember that time when your cult leader got tarred and feathered and you did a bunch of magic healing? And David's like, yeah, I vaguely remember some magic healing that I did. Sure, sure. Hey, why did Joseph Smith get tarred and feathered? A lot of drama around those <laughs> things. <laughs> But I healed him. I healed him. So that don't pay attention to the why. But right, right. I just love the idea that like, so you could heal a guy who was tarred and feathered and his collarbone was broken. Wow. With powers like that, I guess nobody in your town ever had any medical problems, huh? Right, right. And there sure wouldn't be any division in your church with what with all the magic powers going around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with that kind of miracles, I'll bet nobody questioned anything ever. Yeah. <laughs> so... So we drop back into the flashback so we can explain why everyone questioned everything, right? At this point, Joe had gone back to his fake book dictating roots, I guess. He was um, <laughs> restoring the Bible. Go with what you know, man. <laughs> yeah. By, by restoring, they mean rewriting, of course. Yeah. I love that the Mormon's own website says that the, the Joseph Smith translation, which is what they call this thing, mm -hmm. is, quote, a revision or translation of the King James Version of the Bible, which, you know, that's in English, guys. Yeah, translated that one from English. Did you? you don't need to translate that. You're fine. He's got his face in the hat. Sorry, old habits die hard. I just... It's right here, isn't it? It's just sitting in front of me. Also, I just have to point out that he introduces this flashback with converts came and went. Leaders rose and fell. And anyone who's aware of Mormon history, that's a fucking understatement, baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That sentence is doing a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> so as he's doing his fucking restored rewriting of the Bible or whatever, Oliver barges in and he's like, I need to talk with you alone, Joey, for a minute. And he's like, no, I'm sure there's nothing. He's like, alone for a minute. So Sidney Rigdon walks out and he's like, Ah, uh, so um, you uh, you fucking extra ladies now, man, publicly and uh, everything. Why would you put this in the movie? <laughs> Why? You don't have to put this in the movie. You don't. You did not. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you that this was their idea, their way of like nodding at polygamy without admitting that it was like yep. 50 women. Like they, they're like, we're just going to look. We admit that there were other people. Ladies, we were not going to talk about the ones that were, you know, teenagers or the ones that were yep. already married to another guy that he sent away or anything else. We never see another wife. We never hear about it again nope. after this. It's just this easy way of being like, look, we acknowledged it. It's right yes, there. We it, acknowledged it. Exactly. And if you didn't already know that Mormons practice polygamy, you wouldn't learn it from this scene, right? Because it's kind of right. vague. Oliver's like, you know, I need to talk to you about that young woman that uh, does your laundry or whatever, or, or, or is she your wife now? And he's like, I am, you know, living in the way of the biblical Isaac and blah, blah, blah. And that's all they ever really say. Right. Which, by the way, he does. He mentioned he says this is the way of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Only one of those guys had multiple wives at the same time. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, but you know, they all wanted to. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. We know <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah. Look, God wants me to fuck more beautiful young women, dude. What can I say? It's That's God's will, man. Yeah. And I love that he threatens him here with being smitten. He's like, you yes. want to be smitten? Is this how you get smitten, <laughs> Joseph? Okay. You're smitten. No, you are. <laughs> I feel I feel like the yeah, the, the scene with the two guys who have the most sexual tension in the whole show yelling about getting smitten. It feels yeah. a little on the nose. <laughs> so, and then speaking of shit, they should have just kept their fucking mouths shut about. This is where we learn about that time that Joseph Smith made his own bank and then told all his followers to put their money in it. And then immediately lost all their fucking money. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Let me explain why. Okay. We opened a bank. <laughs> why am I telling this part? You asked me such a straightforward. <laughs> Did he give him some kind of... Is there a cut scene where he gave him, like, Veritaserum from the Harry Potter universe <laughs> and he just can't... <laughs> He got a child made a liar, liar wish before this interview. This is another moment where my best worst comes into this. Like, I don't know who this movie is for because yes. they're talking about it's not great to own property. That should all just go to the church. And basically, Joseph is calling for communism. Yep. To a group of people like 
There is no group of people in modern America who love property and hate communism more than the Mormons. Right. And they, he's reminding that they're reminding them that this is what Joseph basically wanted. It's absurd. Yeah. So we, we get this scene of everybody freaking out, everybody at the church getting all upset because the, the bank is headed towards insolvency. Joseph Smith comes up and chastises everybody. He's like, look, I did not take everyone's money and just con you out of it is what had would what that's what didn't just happen. And everybody's like, oh no, that's definitely what didn't just happen. I just have to say at one point a guy stands up and he's like, You said God ran the bank. And he said, No, I said it uh, here's what I said. Here is what I said. I said if everyone behaved the way God, okay, I got it. If everyone behaves <laughs> the way God wants you to, the bank the will go bank great. Yeah, right, is right. gonna be <laughs> yeah. run away. Also, can I just say that in this scene, we start with a thing that happens later, like to several people in the the suit that Sidney Rigdon is wearing in this scene is astoundingly bad. It's it the, might as well be made of all the poor people's money. It is the, <laughs> it's got giant polyester lapels on a comically yeah. oversized jacket. It looks like they tried to modify a Frankenstein costume from a particularly cheap pop-up Halloween store. <laughs> so, it's so bad. There's no time in history when that was the fit. Nope. I'm just saying. Sure wasn't. So that so Joe leaves. He he happens upon a couple of other characters who are all yelling about how you know there's a lot of reasons why this bank went under, but Joseph Smith sure wasn't one of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is where they they accuse Ward. They're like, Ward, you stole all the money. He's like, No, I did. What's that over there? <laughs> yeah, he, no, he never says no. I didn't. They're just like, Well, you stole the money, and he's like, I. I'm going go to go start my Chino. own sect of this religion. Yeah, this is right. my religion now. Yes. I've got my own. I Now that I have money. And none of them are like, could you give it back? The <laughs> money that you stole? <laughs> yes, and only. Yeah, they're, they're literally, <laughs> they're just sitting there like, damn it. If only there was something that could be done after someone steals. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. So, but, and then, and then we cut to the next scene and I love this so much. This was the greatest punchline in the movie and the movie had no fucking idea. I had to pause this movie for like a minute and a half. They come back. The narrator goes, yeah, well, the bank went under only lasted for three weeks, <laughs> three weeks. None of the loan payments would have even come due yet. Three fucking weeks. What do we think? Did, did did Joseph just stand at the back stuffing the money into his clothes? Yes. Like a marshmallow man and then walk out the back yes. door? It's clear. Well, I think it has to be that. I think the idea was that it was supposed to be everybody give the bank all of your money and then we just pay for everybody's things. It was literally that communist mm -hmm. and everybody was just like, um, okay, I'll give you a little bit. It's, wait, it's what now? No. And it literally fell apart and the guys did steal and everything went wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, but I love that in this scene, he says the bank only lasted three weeks, but you know, it was a bad economy. Yeah. Like He's literally <laughs> nothing could have happened in three weeks time right. in a bad the economy. economy. The economy didn't change over that three weeks. He says, he literally says a lot of banks went bust around that time. I'm like, after three fucking weeks. <laughs> Not every three weeks. It's like guys who were like, got fired for sexually harassing a mailman. And they're like, yeah, the recession. I lost my job in 2011. And you know, the recession. <laughs> Session really hit everybody yes. hard. Yeah, but David in the interview, he's like, now, yeah, there's a lot of reasons that bank went under, but none of them were because Joseph was a thieving, stealing bastard. That's sure the correct truth. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. And and so so Joe, in the flashback, goes back to see Martin, who apparently didn't invest in the fucking NFTs this time. No, right? the one time Martin almost kind of sort of didn't fall for it. Right. Yeah. And he goes to see Martin. He's like, yeah. And, and he's like, God needs your help. And he's like, do you mean my money? And he's like, I exactly that. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Why? What Again, I mean. 
<laughs> if God could just get a little loan till his next check comes <laughs> in, Martin. <laughs> no, man, it's not me. If it were me, I would never ask for this at all. But it's the Lord. The Lord. But God's car broke down and the bus tickets from here. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I need a car seat and the taxi with the car seat is excellent. <laughs> For my son, Jesus. Jesus will totally get you back with interest, I promise, man. And Joseph Smith's like, you know, if you think about it, Martin, the fact that you didn't put all your money in the bank is a, a lot of the reason why it failed, you know? So it's really kind of your fault more than mine. And he's like, is it though? And he's like, yeah, no, it totally is. <laughs> so then we got to Martin bailing Joe out. <laughs> We got to him like buying useless land in Kirtland, Ohio to make up for the losses of the bank. Yeah. And the banker's like, are you giving Joseph the deed again? And he's like, no, this land's in my name. And he's like, but but Joe's going to use it for the church and to bail out his bank. Right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, and then they get and then get you kicked out of it and you know, I'll have to run to a different state. And you go, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that. Yeah. I mean, at least he retained the deeds. That's, uh, you know, that's the wisdom of being a 400 times bitten twice shot. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So, oh, there's this great moment, too. So so Joseph's like hugging his wife. The first one, Emma, the, the first one. The only one that's, that we'll ever see ever. Right. Yeah, exactly. Certainly the only one we'll ever see him hugging. And he's like, yeah, you know, it lo it feels like I've, I've lost Oliver and Sydney and really all the named characters at this point. And Emma, employing the term, a lot of people think the way Marsh does on Be Reasonable says, yeah, a lot of people think that you're a fraud. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, well, what do you think, Emma? And she says, I think we should talk about a different subject. Different subject. Well, the way, he, <laughs> the way he words it, he says, well, what does the prophet's wife think? And she goes, uh -huh. I, I just thought she should say, don't know. Should I go ask her? <laughs> oh, you mean me? I'll take a poll. We'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so meanwhile, you got... Oliver, David, et al., they're all rabble, 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 and in a room somewhere about what to do, whether Joseph Smith should stay in charge, whether they should put someone else in charge, et cetera. And the guy who's leading the meeting is literally, his name is Parrish, and he's, he's one of the ones that goes off and starts his own religion later, but he's the one who stole all of the money. <laughs> And like, literally, it's it's like the whole, everyone in there is like, hey, isn't this whole thing his fault? Shouldn't we kick him out? And they're like, we can't kick him out. He called the meeting. It's our, He literally, to, yeah. He goes, let's, it's, 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 that's not the point. Okay. The point <laughs> is, yeah, like, why are you bringing up old shit? Yeah. We're exactly. all mad. At Joe. If anyone wants to know what the inside of company meetings are like when I get us sued, it's a little like this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and so some rando goes like, I think David Whitmer should be in charge. And somebody else goes, why? And he's like, I don't have a follow-up line, dude. Why the fuck would you do that? I don't. It's I don't not know. We were, we were all just yelling a lot, and it seemed like something I could say. I don't know. I don't know what we're yelling about. <laughs> By the way, the reason why there's not a line here is because David started his own church claiming to have divine intervention from God, mm -hmm. a lie that he later did take back. So the reason they can't have that line is because David would have been like, because I talked to God and he said, I'm the president of Jesus now. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. So, yeah. But ultimately, I guess the schemers have schemed to steal Mormonism from Joseph Smith at gunpoint. Which is amazing because literally nobody in the meeting goes, hey, wait a minute. Maybe the whole thing has been stupid all along. Right. Like, come on. Why are we trying to fix this religion? It's all based on this one guy. You could just jettison him and leave. None of you have to keep going. Well, but that's exactly. And, and, and if it wasn't just for the fact that they were all in it for the money and the, the power that you have when you lead people in a religion, that's what they would absolutely do. Right. <laughs> but the movie never bothers to, to kind of like recognize that fact that if it wasn't for the fact that they were going like, but you know, we got these congregation of idiots that are just going to keep giving us money and doing what we tell them and giving us their wives and shit, you know, like, like let's, let's, let's make good on that, you know, without admitting that that's what was going on. There's no reason at all for them to have this conversation. A hundred percent. But so so we get this scene where like in the middle of the services, one guy comes, steps up with a gun and he goes, I'm this religion now. And the other guy's like, I don't think that's how it works. And another guy steps up with a gun. And he's like, I assure you, that's how it works. And they're like, well, fuck. <laughs> and that guy turns to Oliver Cowdery and he's like, hey, um, man, a little we'll help. help here. And Oliver is <laughs> like, 
I'm sorry, I gotta take this call. I gotta take this. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? God? T- don't don't be in that room anymore. Okay, oh, God, okay. if you well, say so. so. <laughs> Literally, it feels like that some rando, we don't even know who these people are, but some rando just goes, Look at me. Look at me. I'm the prophet now. <laughs> so so then we cut to we cut to I guess these people are now on trial, sort of. They're on kangaroo trial or whatever for dissenting and trying to steal Mormonism. This is where like Sidney Rigdon denounces them. Yeah. And we get I don't even know what their apology what this apologetic is apologizing for. I have no fucking <laughs> clue what's going on here, right? So Martin, David, and Oliver all get excommunicated. No, they didn't, but it wasn't official, but it was oh. official, but they came back, but no, they didn't. This is- yeah, literally, they're all desperately upset, like tearfully reading these letters. They are so upset that they are excommunicated from the church that they left. Yes. <laughs> well, they- you already left. Why are you mad? <laughs> this movie is collapsing in on itself, right? <laughs> right. The li- like at a certain point, the lies don't uphold the other lies. So they're like, okay, we did leave, but then we got kicked out. But Joseph didn't sign the letter. But he was probably there when they wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I- there was a lot of men. It's like someone asking me about any of my breakups. They're like, hey, why were any of your breakups? And I'm like, oh, you know, people drift apart. And there's there's like so long. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> oh, and and then we re-enter suddenly and absolutely inexplicably. We are back to the Cockney voiceover. I didn't. Yes. This Yeah, this movie is literally crumbling under its own weight. But apparently it even it even backs out to the interview at this point for a second. And he's like, so wait a minute. So so you were kicked out of the church. And he's like, I was cast out under the threat of violence. And the interviewer goes, well, who threatened violence? And David Whitmer goes, does it matter? And everyone says, why would it not matter? Yeah, it absolutely fucking matters. (laughs) I mean, it had to be Joseph at that point, right? Right. It was like literally the good guys. That's why we're hiding from this. Exactly. Right. Yeah, right. If it was fucking Parrish or whatever, they'd have been like, well, yeah, there's the guy with the mustache from earlier. Yeah, right. (laughs) So they all went off and they all founded their own fucking religions is what happened in real life. Yeah. Right. (laughs) The movie might as well extend its hands out from a screen and wave them in their faces just saying it was a whole thing. We don't like to talk about it. (laughs) And I know, Noah, that you think that it's that there's a money motive here. But I mean, these people are all vying for the literally ones of hundreds of followers (laughs) That this religion has, <laughs> I'm right. I'm so confused by. I mean, it is the worst, stupidest power grab of all time. But it so really is. They did it. Yeah, but and then it, the the fucking movie makes this big deal. The narrator cuts in and says, you know, it, and this is the whole point of the fucking film, right? They're like, it was a really like nasty breakup, and all of these people, these three witnesses that signed the book and said that they saw the plates and their visions or whatever, they all left the church, and so if they were gonna ever admit that it was a lie, this would have been the time to do it, right? When they were all mad at each other or whatever. But, and then movie's like, and they didn't, so therefore it must have been true. But it's like, what you're saying is that they never admitted publicly that they knowingly engaged in fraud and built their entire careers on it. Because again, these people all went and started their own versions of Mormonism and shit. Yeah, exactly. Why would they admit that they were fucking lying? That would like, that would fuck up their whole thing. <laughs> Also, those some of those guys spent way too much time sitting in in a room and writing for like literally months on end. So you you don't let go of that, you, right? You don't, yeah, you, no. you, you don't turn your back on that. And also, you know, they had a vague quasi hallucination where they kind of thought they saw the plates sort of once, right? And and remembered it more and more vividly every time they told the story. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So and then we, we get the scene where like Martin, like Martin's in still in the church after they've kicked out Joseph Smith and they and they've they've moved on to new leadership. And they're like, and I think we can all agree this Book of Mormon is stupid and it's nonsense. And Martin stands up and he says, it's not stupid. It's not nonsense. You're all going to hell. You're stupid. And then he just sits down and like he's like, but proceed. <laughs> <laughs> but but I am a member of this church now and not the other one. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me. Although you are going to all burn in hell for being part of this church that I'm part of. Yeah. <laughs> and then we cut over to Nauvoo, 
right? Where Joey and the Mormons are starting over once again. Why? Don't ask. No reason. Just they decided that they wanted to go elsewhere. God was like, you know what? Further west then. <laughs> It's like the seventeenth move in the in the movie, guys. Do we maybe want to know? They just moved no, just, yeah, to Mosquito just, Creek, Iowa, because of how appealing that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's gotten to the point where they they're literally not even say they say Nauvoo. They don't even say Illinois. They're just they've given up really? entirely on explaining anything. It's just right. like oh, and then we went to Nauvoo. I don't know. It's a weird. Oh, all word. the way run all the way to the western border of the country at that point. No, no, we had they kept running us off from there too. <laughs> I I love this part of the movie because it's very clearly someone's Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith making up fan fiction. Yes, right. <laughs> because let's be clear. They never made up. Nope. Right? Joseph Smith died and Oliver Cowdery showed up and was like, hey, now that that asshole's out of here, how about we do some genocide, huh? Who wants to be yeah. on this side of the genocide? <laughs> am I right? <laughs> but what they have instead is a fucking Twilight fan fiction of him waking up and being like, oh, my good friend Joseph, I have so many regrets that I'll never speak about publicly or write down anywhere about my good friend Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. And again, the movie is so confused by itself at this time that Joseph sends a letter he that he's not writing. He has his brother send a letter to Oliver. We cut to Oliver reading the letter, and then a Chiron comes up on that scene that says four years after the death of Joseph. Right. So apparently that letter fuck, movie? took four years to get to him, or he spent four years reading it. It was so confusing. And then we yeah. get this weird montage, dream montage that Oliver's having of like all of these moments with Joseph and his, and then it ends with, I died. I literally died. I was laughing so hard. Joseph being shot in the jail and falling out of the window and Oliver and his wife are somehow underneath Joseph Who's fall the camera is looking directly up and it's this weird green screen of of Joseph falling down. I was I I it's worth it. I that. thought he was gonna look up and he was gonna be on the ceiling covered in rose petals, American <laughs> beauty style. <laughs> That's what I was really expecting at this point in the film. Yeah, we get Ollie's nightmare about Joseph Smith dying right before you could say, I forgive you and I'm sorry, and you were right. Yeah. So Oliver goes to a Mormon congregation to fucking fight his his nightmares or whatever but will they welcome Oliver back as one of their so they so they welcome Oliver back as one of their own nothing happens there yeah <laughs> this guy reaches out his hand i really want like the the he goes up to the to the bishop of the who's talking to the congregation there and he and the bishop walks up to him with a serious face and then reaches out his hand for a handshake and I really wanted him to do that whole yank it away and smooth his hair thing. Yeah, oh, right. Psych. Would have gotten him so Psych. good. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, he's like, it's so good to see you, Oliver. And we're all like, Do have we met this character yet? Who is this? Is this a person with <laughs> character that we know? And then he's like, why don't you give a speech right now on the spot, Oliver? And Oliver's like, woof, man. Yeah. Okay, shit. Jesus. <laughs> but oh he did have a little something prepared hello everyone i just um oh god i didn't even really know what to say pulls out cue cards um, <laughs> <laughs> i seek not to be the leader of this church yes i do again i just want to be a good member Right, maybe right. Maybe we right. do a little the, genocide together. <laughs> well, yeah, his actual speech is, I failed when I tried to start my own religion, so I'd like to be part of yours again. So, and they're yeah. like, yeah, no, okay, we need what we can, we'll take what we can get at this point. <laughs> I'm glad that you guys were paying attention because at this point, my eyes had glazed over so much and all I could focus on was the fact that there was an extra in the front row of the congregation that looked that thought he was in the Sopranos. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, there was Jelly was in the front row for sure. He had literally resting forget about it face. It was amazing. <laughs> but the congregation all nods. They'll take Oliver back, so he gets rebaptized, and then and everyone lived. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, yeah, so Mormonism was. Yeah. And so oh, so now we get we, we cut to the interview. I guess now it's like they, he, they've interviewed all night, you know, and now it's early the following morning. And the interviewer guy is like, OK, so is it at least possible that Joseph deceived you when he showed you the plates? And I'm like, 
that's actually an overstatement of the effort Joseph Smith put into it, actually. <laughs> I did not get hypnotized. Do you hear how insane the response that is to are you wrong? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. He's like, is there any way you could be mistaken? And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, there's a great reason not to trust someone. <laughs> Literally yeah. the only wrong answer to that question. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He's like, is there any way this was a hallucination? And he's like, I saw with these eyes and I heard with these ears, which is, I guess, exactly how a hallucination would feel. So Whose hallucinations work like that. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'm not foolish enough to be deceived. And I'm like, oh, that's music to a con man's ears. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ, you idiot. How could he hypnotize my ears? Ears, my ears weren't watching the watch. You sound like an idiot. <laughs> you sound like an idiot right now. <laughs> so, and then we go back to the flashback one more time. We're, we're back to 1833 in Independence, Missouri. We've gone further west, yes. And the Mormons are, this, we've caught back up with the them getting run out of town moment, the die for a lie bullshit moment from the beginning. Yeah. Right? So they, they round David up again. They put him in the middle and they're like, we're going to shoot everybody unless you admit that you were lying about the golden plates. And he's like, I cannot tell a lie. And they're like, okay, we're kidding. We weren't going to really shoot you though. Okay, let him go. And the whole crowd's like, what? what? He's like, yeah. <laughs> How come? Wait, what? What are we? Why are we doing? I thought we were here to kill these guys. Well, no, this, this actually never didn't actually happen. happened. No, <laughs> so we can't have. It was actually a, a marshal who just showed up at his door and was like, "You're a fraud," and the guy was like, "No, I'm not." And we were like, "Well, then get the fuck out of town." But um, <laughs> this scene did actually break my heart, though. That level of overacting is genuinely painful to me. It's hard yeah, to watch. Yeah, for it sure, is. it's a little rough. So, okay, so then we cut back to the interview one last time to wrap things up. We have to clarify because we never saw within the movie, we never saw Martin Harris see the plates. Yeah. But he's one of the three witnesses. So as sort of an afterthought, they're like, oh, wait, didn't you say that Martin Harris was supposed to have seen the plates? They're like, and he's like, yeah, he remembered later that he actually had seen them on that day that we saw. He was in an embarrassing fight in front of a room full of people and stood up and screamed, I saw him plates in an angel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Right. He told us later that he had actually seen the plates. That's how truth works, right? We're now in the fan fiction of someone's because that's Martin Harris's fan fiction, right? right. Someone <laughs> yes. was embarrassing him in front of a church congregation once. And he was like, actually, what happened is Edward and Jacob, one time they went to <laughs> Europe together. And as they were on the balloon, they kissed. <laughs> and it's on my fucking fan fiction page. And you can't take it down. <laughs> you can't. You can't take AO3 down because it's there forever. <laughs> So we flash over to Martin praying for the plates and he still can't see him and he cries for the absence of holy revelation. But then Joseph Smith kneels down beside him and he prays even better and God changes his mind and shows fucking Martin the, the headlights. Not before, like Martin finishes his prayer and Joseph just stays kneeling mm -hmm. and Martin kind of looks over at him and is like, oh, and so he, and he's like, I guess I'll just get up and walk away then. And he literally stands up and starts to walk away with Joseph just kneeling there. Yeah. And then yeah. and then the miracle happens and brings. Right. Him. Yes. Then Willem gets to see the sailboat. Yeah. And to be clear, right, if we were to accept Martin's narrative, the rest of Martin's narrative where he loses his faith is fucking insane. Right. <laughs> if I saw an angel right now in the middle of this podcast, I'd stop podcasting. Sure I would. would make the almost done five minutes hand gesture and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Martin left the Mormon church. He, he saw did. an angel and it presented him with golden plates. And he was like, they all did. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking insane. So, yeah. And then and, and then so we cut back to the interview and David's like, so, Mr. Kelly, do you believe me? And he's like, I'm not going to exactly say that I do because I'm actually a historical person. Right. But I'm not going to say I don't believe you either. Well, because they, that's the best we could do. Because the whole framing of this movie is based on the one interview that makes the most, that puts them in the best light. So, right. Yeah. Well, so, and I, that's worth pointing out. Thank you, Dan, for bringing that up, right? Because again, famously, David was the most interviewed of the witnesses. He would talk to anybody that would listen to him. And almost everybody came away saying, well, that guy's obviously full of shit. But there was this one guy that wrote for the fucking 
Charleston Observer Star or something that wrote one article that said, well, he definitely seemed genuine and seemed to believe what he was telling me. And that's the one they've built this entire movie around. That's why they have to act like David was all reticent to talk to him, right? Because if they admit, well, actually, he talked to hundreds and hundreds of reporters in his lifetime, then they also have to admit that 999 of them thought he was full of shit. Right. Right. Yep. So, yeah. So... And then there's this stupid fucking reveal, right? Because he's been whittling at this damn box the whole time. And the reporter's finally like, he's like, I can see you really want me to ask what's in that box. So what's in that box? And he's like, well, this box has the letter I was talking about earlier. He's like, oh, that doesn't seem like much of a real deal. And he's like, and a handwritten copy of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. And of course, we're supposed to be Mormons watching this movie. And we're supposed to look at that the way that like I would look at the like handwritten notes from the guy who made Space Invaders or whatever from back <laughs> in the day or something. But then like even the movie has to be like, right, but this isn't evidence of anything because we all agree that a book was written. Right. He's like, yes. Right. I just thought maybe you would like to see it. it yeah. But this is the original handwritten manuscript minus the first hundred and some odd pages. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's actually even funnier than that because it's not. He He says printer's copy yeah, and right, the reason yes. he, the reason he says printer's copy instead of the mm -hmm. printer's copy is the grammatically correct version would be a printer's copy of which there were several dozen distributed right yes. this would be like me being like I have this authentic Kevin Sorbo autograph isn't he still alive yes <laughs> So, Although this that copy would still be worth a lot because that is before they made all of the literally 4,000 plus edits that they've made right. since that time. So it'd be neat to be able to see like yeah. what it actually, like how crappy, if whatever you read, it was bad. Mm. That one's even worse. Right. Times 4,000. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, and then that's where the movie wraps up. We get a little breakfast club close, you know, the thing comes on and tells us, and you know, all, the, Oliver went on to do this. They, they, they're curiously silent about the, like, and started his own schism offshoot religion. They don't mention that right. about anybody. They do mention that Martin Harris came back to the church and they say after 50 years out of the church, Martin Harris came back, which actually it's a small thing, but the movie can't math. That was totally wrong. It was 40 years tops which doesn't matter in the scheme of things, but just fucking do your math right, movie. God. Right, it shows you what kind of research these guys were actually doing. Yeah, they yeah. forgot to carry the one. So, <laughs> so, yeah, but the book, the book of Mormon went on to be super awesome. And it all ends with, once again, with them saying, and none of the three men ever said that they were a bunch of fucking liars and thereby <laughs> lost all credibility to history. So they must not have been lying. Yeah. The end. It's funny because I, I have, when you say to a Mormon, you know that all those guys left the church, right? They go, ah, oh, but none of them ever denied it. And it's like, you didn't save anything. No, there's not, there's nothing resolved by you pointing that out. Right. Yeah. But they didn't admit they were full of shit. At best, you've made it a little bit more confusing, <laughs> but like you didn't solve the problem. No. All right. Well, I'll tell you what move Mormon movie month is off to a hell of a start. Thanks to you, Dan. Thank you so much for your help today, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Next time, choose a movie that isn't four hours long. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, and oh, no. hey, quick. If the list, <laughs> there are two Mormon movies that aren't four hours long, man. Sorry. And just one more time, really quickly, if the listeners wanted to hear more from you, where should they go? Well, uh, so there's Thank God I'm Atheist. That's uh, one of the podcasts, wherever the podcasts are. And the new show is Data Over Dogma, if you want to learn a lot that you did not know about that Bible of yours. Yeah, it's a great show. Great show. And of course, those will be linked on the show notes. And while well, that's going to do it for our review of Witnesses, that's not going to do it for Mormon Movie Month because we still need more Mormonism for next week. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, we've finally found a grainy, multi-part YouTube copy of one of our most requested Mormon movies ever. We will finally be watching... Baptists at our barbecue. Oh, really? This has been like a fucking like the the snipe of god awful movies since mm -hmm. Mormon Movie Month began. The yeah, Mormon pretty, White Whale. Yeah, this is pretty <laughs> impressive. 
All right, so with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 411 to a merciful close. Hey, this is episode 411. Awesome. Once again, a huge thanks to Dan for all his help. Again, links to his stuff on the show notes, and a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that helped make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation Data, D&D Minus, and The Skyfire Crowd, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Far too many hilarious things happen to all the people in this movie, but that's a podcast for another day. Mormonism eventually did learn how to run a bank. <laughs> Dan Beecher forgot about the Breakfast Club class <laughs> thing. Yeah, it <laughs>